Hi there, welcome to Diagonal Move. My name's Neil, and today I'm going to be taking a look at At Any Cost Mets 1870, a boxed hex encounter war game from GMT Games designed by Herman Lutman. I have briefly featured this video, this game on a video before, um, because it is a fantastic game that I thoroughly enjoy. It's actually a game of firsts, um, for me at least. It's a game that represents the first time I bought a big, or at least big for me, boxed hex encounter game. It's the first time I really realised how much I thoroughly enjoy hex encounter games. It's the first time I realised that GMT's complexity scale is a little bit out of whack, being a complexity scale of four, which is surely, surely not right. Um, and it's also a game where I have to relearn the rules every time I play because of the complexity of it. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to have a go at um, explaining some of the rules and concepts in this game, uh, starting off taking a look at the units and the various counters in the game, and then moving on to a hypothetical made up uh, example of play, just to give you a feel for how the game works. I am currently playing through, for I think it's the fourth or fifth time, I've had the game for about 18 months, um, and I, as I said, I am again struggling <laughs> to learn the rules, so learn along with me time, and um, hopefully it will give you a sense of whether this game is for you. It is a very good game, I thoroughly enjoy it, it's got a great narrative flow, there's a lot of, um, particularly when you play solo, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, fog of War type stuff going on in, in it. There's um, some really fun elements to it, but it is one that retaining the rules, shall we say, is something I struggle with. So let's stop waffling and get over to the table and I will try to explain at any cost Mets 1870. Here we are then, with it at any cost. I'm a third of the way through the Bloody Thursday scenario, um, and it's set up on the board as we speak. As you can see, we have the Fr the Prussians in grey, sort of up this line here, and then the French in blue. The scenario is one of the middle range scenarios. If I just show you the the scenario cards quickly, because they're going to be relevant as we move along, assuming I can find them all. Here we go. So. The, the game comes with six scenarios. Um, you have the smaller scenarios, such as uh, these on the screen now, which um, are the small scenarios. These are aimed at being relatively introductory. Then you have the the more the, the main battle scenarios, if you like, and I'm playing the second one here. And if you look at the difference between the two, they, they have become somewhat more complex as you as you go through and then the most complex scenarios are the two campaigns on the back which have uh, a whole bunch of stuff um, that is unique to the campaigns for this video um, and because I haven't actually played the big campaigns um, at the moment because there's a lot of extra rules for them I'm just going to cover the rules up to and including the scenario I'm playing so there will be some things that I haven't included um, because I haven't got to them yet in my learning process through through the game. But I will show as much as I can from what I have learned so far. Um, because this is a game in progress, I've had it up on my coffee table now for about a week and a half, playing a little bit every night or most nights, and I'm only about a third of the way through the game. So I'm not going to use this as the basis for for the video today. It's there to give you a sense of the size and scale of the game. Um, I'm going to use these ones in the corner here and if I just move things along slightly, be able to zoom in a bit more on these, these pieces. Um, what I've got is the relevant chits that you would see or that we're likely to see when I do an example of play. Uh, a bit later on using these pieces down here, the blue soldiers, the French, um, the French fifth, 
Brigade, Fifth Division. Um, they are not part of the scenario I'm playing, but the Prussian Second are. They're actually a reserve unit, which we may or may not get into the reserves specific to this scenario. I haven't decided yet, but we'll see how we go. There's, a, there's quite a lot to get through before we even get to the example of play. Um, so I think I'll start with just a look at the units, uh, or maybe, yeah, let's start with the units, because the units themselves are relatively familiar, I would say, if you've had any experience playing board games at all. So um, each unit has, each division, brigade, has a HQ chip. It'd probably help if I actually decided whether or not they were divisions or brigades, wouldn't it? That would probably be something useful for me to clarify for you. Um, it's brigades. It's brigades. There we go. Uh, each brigade has a HQ. The HQ has two sides, depending on its posture, and we'll get into that a bit later on, but the D and the A refer to aggressive and defensive postures. The number that is in that black colour that is its command range, and that varies depending on whether it is aggressive or defensive. Uh, and then the number at the side, the, the second four, that is its movement point value. Okay, so that's the HQ unit. And each brigade in the game, Prussian and French, do have one of these units, or these HQ units but they may not feature in every scenario. So even if the brigade, even if the second brigade was in a scenario, it may or it may not feature the HQ, depending on the scenario. Um, then we have infantry. Infantry work like most other infantry. You have the, uh, the, the, the name of the detachment or, or the, the, the division brigade, I keep saying that. Um, you have the uh, strength points for its combat value, which is the 8 and the 6. You have the movement value, which is 4 and 3. And then you have what's called the TCR. And the TCR is a measure of its combat effectiveness. And you use that to help resolve uh, the effect of morale hits and so on in combat. But we will get to that. Um, on the reverse of these are the uh, battle-worn sides. So they have a, a front side and a back side, as most games do to some degree or another. Now each infantry chit uh, within the brigade on both sides can be broken down further into uh, detachments. So the top, the full strength French unit here can be broken down into these two um, detachments. That's something I'll come to when we get to the relevant phase of the game as we go through how to play the actual phases, but you can, they can be broken down, but they're slightly weaker, but they are more mobile because of their smaller size. The French, it's two, two detachments. The Prussians can have up to five. We'll get into that a bit later on. Um, then we, things start to, to vary between the different sides. Um, uh, they tend to vary more with the artillery, but so let's cover the cavalry off first. Cavalry, um, same thing. You have a strength, a movement, and a TCR. Cavalry is coloured green and blue because that's the sort of the weight of the cavalry and that's relevant to cavalry charges. I'll get more into that when we do cavalry charges, but there is a difference between this unit and this unit based on the weight of the cavalry, whether it's heavy cavalry, light cavalry, and so on. And then things do start to differ. The artillery, basic artillery, uh, same as before, we have the unit stripe at the top, uh, the strength, the um, movement, and the TCR. So that's the same as the other units. And there is a battle-worn side too. On the French side, we have an extra type of unit that is part of the artillery. And that is called a mitrailleur. 
And this is essentially uh, an early machine gun, like a Gatling gun, that, that type of thing. Within the concept of the game, they are, even though they're really an anti-infantry anti weapon, they are always positioned with their um, parent artillery unit or chit. And that's why this does not have an independent movement or TCR. It's always stacked with the parent artillery unit. Okay, uh, that's quite interesting that early machine guns are in this game. It's, it's one of the interesting things about the historical period is the advancing technology and the old-fashioned tactics. Um, we then also have horse artillery. Both sides have horse artillery and uh, essentially it's a, a more mobile artillery. So it, you can tell it's horse artillery because that, that kind of black shape there or that white shape, which is supposed to be a horse's head. I'm not sure if you can quite make that out on the screen. Um, and again, they, they have um, battle-worn sides as well. Okay, so in terms of the units, if you've played any war games before, it, you'll, you'll be familiar with much of that. Uh, possibly not the Mitchell unless you've played a specific game around the Franco-Prussian War. In terms of uh, other chits you might see during the game, you have the shaken and disrupted counters, which are assigned as a result of combat. Um, and these are a negative modifier um, to your strength points and that TCR when working, working out your uh, morale checks and, and so on. Again, we'll get more into how those are used later. We have a number of markers to do with, our, we have artillery. Uh, artillery cannot move and fire. So we have uh, just a token to say the artillery have fired. We have horse artillery. The horse artillery can fire and move. They're more mobile artillery, but they can fire and move at half strength should they choose to do so. There's a marker for assaults which is infantry assault, and then a marker for cavalry charges. Cavalry will be able to do more than just charge, as we'll get into when we look at cavalry specifically, in terms of how they move and so on. We have markers for uh, ammunition and supply status. Um, there's no line of supply in this game. It's based around command range, um, which Again, we'll get into later, um, but should a unit roll a double, so two twos, two fours, on, on the, whatever, on the on the dice, they end up low ammo. Another double result later on, there's rationed ammo, and they are negative shifts on the uh, fire combat result table. Um, and then finally, we have hasty works and entrenchments. Now, this is one of the things that as the scenarios introduce you gently to the full campaign games, these start to appear, but you don't actually cover the rules for them until you get to the campaign. So basically what, what's happened is um, overnight, uh, and, and the bloody Thursday scenario I'm playing is, is in the morning after the first day, or first day, I'm not sure, but it's, it's the morning after a previous, previous day's battle. Um, and so basically the French have spent their time digging in and they've dug into uh, uh, a relatively good level in the entrenchments or a relatively poor level in the hasty works. The rules for doing that digging in are not covered up to this point, so I won't be covering them, but they will feature. And they are a defensive shift for whoever's inside those works. So we will probably come to those, uh, how they apply, but not necessarily how they are formed. And the camera's going really blurry looking at those. Okay, so that's the units and the status markers. Within the game, there are more. There are more status markers than this. Depends on what, what scenario you're playing. But like I said, we'll just limit it to the scenario I'm playing just for, for my ease, to be honest. Um, okay, moving on to the next layer of chits on this sort of chit pyramid I've got here. Um, we have the activation chits. And these match a brigade. So you pull out of the out of a cup, you, you pull out the DFA 5 brigade, and that's the unit, the brigade that you activate. Nice and simple. And every unit that's in the game will have one of these 
chuck them in the cup with a bunch of other stuff and pull one out and activate the unit, nice and simple. In that cup though, there are other things and the things you will find are command events. And command events, there's some for each side. Um, and this is where the, the, the the blind sword system uh, I mentioned briefly in the overview starts to come in. You can play the events for their command event. And so what that means is, um, if I just go and grab the scenario card. Uh, so here's the scenario card. And we're at the bottom and we can play, as I say, I pull the French command event out of the cup. We can play that French command event to trigger a, um, a later event at the end of a turn. And I'll get more into this later, but you can play them onto the scenario card is what we're getting at here. And they do things that will benefit you during the game if you do that. The, and the, the, uh, the Prussian side can, can do the same. If you choose to play the event, and depending on whether you're Prussians or French, you ha have a scenario, uh, event chip card and they'll do certain things. So for example, Prussian aggressive tactics, if you pull that out as you, and you're French, Prussian aggressive tactics means you can select an infantry or cavalry unit within two hexes of a French combat unit and you force them to fight basically is what you do. Similarly with the inspirational leadership which is a Prussian um, chit, you, you'll do some, something else. I think if you remember rightly something gets to attack twice, uh, I'll have to find the card. Um, and, and each of the, yeah here we go, Prussian inspirational leadership uh, yeah, you, you can basically have a choice of abilities to, to go twice, basically, uh, as far as I can as far as I can remember, without going into too much detail. Um, and so you, you have a whole bunch of these for the Prussians and a, bun and a bunch for the the um, French, and you can play them onto the card. Some you can hold and play later when you choose to, for example, to trigger opportunity fire, which I will get into later. There's a lot of things to come to later. Um, or you can, um, there are others where you have to play them immediately and it will depend on what it says on this piece of paper. Some you can hold, some you play immediately, some you can choose. Okay, so that is what's called the command event chits. Uh, then we have uh, out of command. And out of command relate to the command range of the HQs. Um, and basically what will happen is if the unit is within range, nice and good. If the unit is out of range, you'll pop one of these on at the start of the turn, out of the activation, and nothing will happen to it until a specific out of command step where you flip it over and you see what's on the back and you follow the instructions for what's on the back. And these are pulled at random out of a different chip, chip pull cup and you will do certain things. It's a the disrupted command lines is what that's representing. Um, it's quite good fun. <laughs> it is quite good fun. Um, so those are kind of the, the things you, some of the things you pull out. The other things are up here, and these are quite important. These are the CIC activating chits, or the commander in chief. You have Marshal Bazaine and the Prussian general staff, and these let you activate. Um, in a certain way. You, you, you can you know go twice basically. There are different rules for each of them. So for example in the scenario I'm playing the Prussian general staff didn't appear until I think it was 10 a.m. out of a 12 hour game. Um, 12 hour in terms of an hour on the hour on the hour track on the on the game turn. Um, Marshal Bazaine only appears if you uh, fulfill the uh, event track. So you had to um, on the scenario card, you had to place it onto one of these, and then Marshal Bazaine appears if you roll the correct die roll, having placed the chit. So it, it's representing the various efficiencies or lack thereof in command. And the final shit I'm going to show you, because this will almost certainly crop up, is Fortunes of War. This is everything that can go wrong, will go wrong or conversely will go right. 
that everything, you know, sod's law, so to speak. Um, and you pull that and you'll roll a die and a table will tell you how it either affects the next chip pull, how it affects something else. And so chaos of war is what that is. And that's really good fun again. Okay, so they are the chits that you'll see through the example of play when I get there. Before that though, it's probably worth looking at specific rules uh, and specific processes because the, the things that we show you an example of play, of play are not necessarily everything. We do have um, an entire sequence of play. So you start with planning, then chip draw, then you move to activation, return to chip draw until you have you activated everything that's in the cup and then you move to the end turn okay so i will start with the planning phase but like i said i'm going to use these units here not the units that are set up for the game but a hypothetical example of play using this section here i think it's probably the way to go because of the size of the game Okay, here we are then with my entirely made up hypothetical example of play. What you're about to see does not feature in the game in any way unless you somehow come across it during the course of a game that you're playing yourself. It's not in the rule book, it's just me trying to show you how things work and how they fit together. Uh, I've probably said it several times already now, but I may or I may not cover everything. The intention here is to give you a feel for how the system works. With that caveat said, let's start. Um, do ignore everything, this sort of side over here, these, these kind of green pieces you can see there, they're part of the game I'm playing. The scenario area, or the example of play area, is just this piece here. We do have the scenario card there for when we do the event track stuff, and this stuff here is for the planning phase, which we're about to start. Um, in terms of the map, we have our French units in blue, dotted around Flavigny and VMV, um, and the woods and so on around those. There might even be a town under there somewhere, I'm not sure. Um, so that's our French setup and position. The Prussians are down here near um, Tronvi and Mars Le Tour. And we have a decent representative of the units that you'll see in those two form two formations that I showed you during the unit overview. Um, and for the purposes of this scenario, this example, I keep saying scenario, but it's just my example, is that the Prussians want to get to VMV and the French want to get to Mars Latour. That's that's basically what we're gonna do. Um, now the first thing you need to do during any turn is the planning phase. And in the planning phase, you put in, uh, into the, into the chip cup, the number of uh, activation chits for the number of brigades, divisions that you have. And in this example, we've got two. So you pop those into the cup. That's the first part of the planning phase. Then you place into the cup, based on the scenario rules, the um, commander in chief chits. And you may or may not use both, in this example, we'll just chuck them both in so we can see how they work. The Fortune of War chip, which I've just thrown on the floor, always goes into the cup. Bear with me a moment. Once you pick the Fortunes of War chip, chip up off the floor, it goes into the cup. The uh, next thing you do is you choose, each player chooses one and only one of their available command events. I've chosen Krupp's guns for the Prussians and battlefield conditions for the French. Then, depending on the scenario, you choose at random a number of the remaining chits that you have left. And I'm just going to choose two for each side, um, purely because this is an example, but you'd normally choose up to five, typically. Depends on the scenario. So I'm just going to, at random, pick two for the Prussians and two for the French. The rest go to the side without being revealed. Okay, and that is the entirety of the planning phase. Nice and simple up to that point. 
Um, then comes the chip draw face, and that is exactly what it says on the tin. We um, pull at random one of these uh, chips. And so I've drawn a command event. And that command event is inspirational leadership. Now, I, as I mentioned before, I can play this for its event. I can flip it for its command event. Um, now, for the scenario, I'm not entirely sure how they're going to be, um, how it's going to be translated in my example of play here. But using the scenario card, we can use these to negate the Prussian aggressiveness chip that the French may or may not have, or we can put in reinforcements. So realistically, if we place it on here, we're going to use this one. But our other option is to see what it actually does um, in terms of its event. And on the back of the terrain card, when I can find the terrain card, is the Prussian Prussian event uh, card. And so we have inspirational leadership. So we, we hold it and that means we can play it when the time comes, if we choose not to use it in a command event track. Um, remove a morale hit, that's quite good. Uh, a successful rally, mm, okay. Um, or we could do something with the assault combat if you get a particular result. I think what I would do for the purposes of this one, I will play it onto the command track. Um, if you don't play it onto the command track, if there's nothing on that command track at all, you cannot at the end of the turn do anything here. So, you know, for the purposes of this scenario and the point we're at, I will place it there. Moving on to the next chip draw. And this time I have drawn the second brigade under Franceschi, Prussian scope. Now we have done up to now the chip door phase. So we're now moving on to the activation and we're going to do each of these sub steps in turn um, and then return back to that chip door phase. So the first thing you do is you determine who is in command and to determine who's in command, you need to decide on a posture. So Franceschi is here. We can play him defensively or aggressively. Depending on what posture you take, depends on what you can do. Um, and I'll probably just get this up on the screen so that I can show you back of the terrain card, I think. Um, so the postures, you, if you play aggressively, you can move, you can fire. You can engage, which means move next to a unit ready for assault combat, and you can cavalry charge. However, you cannot use road march, rally, or build earthworks. Okay, defensively, you can you can basically do the things you can't do um, when you're aggressive, but you cannot engage, assault, or have a cavalry charge. Okay, so that's the important thing to decide. Do you want to be an aggressive leader? Or a defensive leader. So that's the first thing to think about. Um, in addition to what you can do on your turn, the command range comes into play. And for a defensive posture, the command range is three. For the aggressive posture, the command range is four. And I think what we'll do, because our, our, our unit was here, we will have a aggressive posture or an aggressive posture. Um, and to determine the command range, you count the hexes more or less, he says. Um, so for example, these these are within four. They're adjacent, they're all in command. Then you count away from the the um, the HQ to the ones that are distant. So for example, here we have one, two, three four but you don't have to go down the road you can go this way and in which case it's one two three four so this cavalry is in command range no problem the person who is adjacent to him 
is also in command. So those two are both in command. So even though this um, artillery here is not in command um, as well, they're not within four, they're still within command because they have that adjacency to a unit that is in command. And this can chain off into a whole sort of string of units. Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, but there's a gap, so we have to work out the adjacent, the command, sorry, of these guys here, these two infantry units. Um, and so doing the same thing, we, we count. So it's it's on the road. Now roads, um, for the purposes of command only, both major roads, which is a thick brown line, and the minor roads are um, half a point. So rather than being one, two, three, four, five, six, it's actually one, two, three. He's in command, therefore he is also in command. So everybody is in command at this point. And that is the that is the um, HQ command step done. That's that's the first step. Let me move on to fire combat. Now, fire combat is going to be affected by things like line of sight, um, distance, um, and and a few other bits and bobs. And you're going to roll the dice and and then modify the fire chart based on certain factors. Um, so for example, we will go through and we'll choose a unit to fire uh, or several units to fire uh, just for the demonstration really. So um, when you're looking at things to fire, infantry and artillery have different effective ranges. Um, artillery have um, canister range, but French and Prussian artillery have different effectiveness as well. The Prussian artillery was basically better, but the French did have the Mitrilla, which the Prussians did not. You can then, you'll then adjust for things like canister range, extended range, whether it's 50% um, more of your strength points or half of your strength points if you're extended range. You would then modify for things like Prussian artillery, whether you're firing with a Mitrilla unit, low ammo, rationed ammo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, different events that you can play if you've held on to them. Terrain, if the target's in certain terrain, including hasty works and entrenchments, um, loads of different things. You roll the dice, you roll two dice. Um, the unit dice, which in this example is going to be gray, and the white dice. And the gray dice would be uh, referenced here. So if you rolled a seven, and hypothetically speaking, if you have a five after all adjustments, you would roll across the seven and you get here and have a morale test. The morale test is the total on the die, uh, plus or minus any modifiers indicated on the chart, um, minus the TCR. And the TCR is that, that, uh, that red number we were looking at before. Um, and then whether you have a negative number after minusing one from the other or a positive number depends on how badly shot up the unit you've targeted is. Okay, and then depending on your status of shaken or disrupted and so on and so forth, you then move to whether you break test. And then there are some further calculations to see whether you're, you're battle worn, whether you're a casualty hit and so on. We'll get to that as we go through. Okay, but the first thing we need to do is decide who we're going to shoot with. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to sh shoot the... Uh, it's important to remember that artillery cannot move and shoot. Um, so let's just shoot with our infantry. So this infantry guy is going to shoot at him. It's one, two hexes, three hexes away, um, and a three hex range for the Prussian infantry is beyond extended. We cannot shoot with that infantry unit. So let's shoot with the artillery. He's actually horse artillery. And this begs the question, do we want to move and shoot? And for the purposes of the scenario, we do. And so with horse artillery, if I just grab one of those tokens, um, you you can half, half fire and half move. Strength of the horse artillery here is, this one is three. So we'd round that down to one and a half. 
fractions are rounded down, so it's a strength point of one, okay? Um, and so he's gonna shoot here uh, with a strength point of one. He is in effective range because the effective range of artillery is two to four and the unit is three away. So that's no problem. So we have a strength of one. Now we're gonna do our adjustments. We don't have any events or anything like that to play. Um, but we are Prussian artillery, so we're going to move from one to two. Um, we're not obscured, we don't have low ammo, uh, we're not using any events, uh, and the opposing unit is, is very foolishly out in the open. So there are no defensive modifiers either. Okay, so all we do then, very simple example, is we roll the dice, we've rolled a seven and a nine. Okay. So the seven, the reference is seven on the two column, which is going to be a morale check. No problem, straightforward morale check. And you take away the target unit's TCR from the modified result. So seven and the unit has a, a um, TCR in red there of seven, so that's a zero. So he has to take a morale hit. And without any other tokens on him currently, a morale hit is a simple, straightforward, shaken result. Okay. So the horse artillery has done the first part of his move. The, uh, sorry, his move and fire action. This artillery, we're going to fire. Now he has seven. Um, but it begs the question of do we shoot at him um, because the effective, the, well, the extended range of artillery is, uh, Prussian artillery anyway, is eight. So could we reach something else? Um, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, we could. Okay. Now, this is going to bring, we're going to shoot across here at the unit in the forest. And this is going to bring into play the line of sight rules and I'm, I'm gonna have to read this off the rule book because these are quite um, there are a number of different um, ins and outs to this uh, so line of sight we are um, if we obviously we're the firing unit the French unit is in this kind of uh, both wooded terrain plus it's on a hill it's not a particularly steep hill but it is a hill nevertheless and so firing unit and target unit Firing unit is at a lower elevation. Um, any intervening hex that is higher will block. We don't have a blocking hex in that sense. It's um, going to shoot along here. Um, if any intervening hex is at the same level as the firing unit, such as forest, forested, or town, any or a unit, the line of sight is obstructed. Okay, so the line of sight is going to be obstructed. All right, extended range. And are we at extended range? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, we're at extended range and the line of sight is obstructed. Okay, so let's roll the two die. We've got a two and a three. Okay, extended range is 50%. 50% of your strength points. That unit is actually quite powerful artillery. Uh, he's at strength of seven, but we're gonna round that down to three and a half because of extended range and drop, drop the fraction to three. Okay, so he's now at a strength of three, uh, which is that column there, isn't it? And um, we've rolled a two, which is not great, I have to say. So here, that would be no effect if there was no modifiers. Now, we do have modifiers because we are Prussian. And the simple fact that we're Prussian moves us a long one. Um, however, sadly, we do have obscured line of sight, so we're back down here. Uh, is that right? We rolled a two, moved to Prussian. Nope, we're down to one. Um, the target unit is actually in a forest as well, so he gets a further two column shift, and we can't go any lower than the bottom column, so we're at C. Okay, so we're at C. Um, nothing else is applicable, so we just simply roll for the, um, we just apply the result at the two, which is no effect not the best um, but that artillery has now fired so it can't move later the HQ cannot fire 
Um, we do have in here, we have artillery again, plus um, uh, a, a infantry unit. Um, it is crying out at me, and the way I've set it up, to use that artillery on the cavalry, because there would be a fantastic buff, but if I did that, there's a good chance the cavalry would run away, and that would spoil me, showing you something, oops, something else later. Um, so we're not going to do any firing with those. Cavalry can't fire. So we are back now to Heart, which is, sorry, that's the name of the, of the unit. Um, and we're not going to do anything with them. And I don't feel the need to do anything with these because we will, I could do, I could still shoot with these. Come on, let's shoot with the, the um, let's shoot with the infantry unit here. Okay. Uh, so we're going to roll um, two dice. He's within range this time. I think he's at extended range. But before we do that, I'm just going to pick up all the things I knocked off the table. Maybe this is one of the reasons why this game takes me so long. Bear with me. Okay, activation chits rescued from under the sofa. Uh, no harm done to any cardboard during the making of this video, I promise. Um, Okay, where were we? We were looking at the possibility of shooting with this unit here. He has a strength of eight. Uh, he is an infantry unit. He can hit at extended range, the cavalry. We may want to hit or shoot at the artillery, soften him up a bit maybe. However, the town will block line of sight, as you might expect. Um, so that is probably not going to be an option. Um, so if you want to shoot with that guy, we're going to have to shoot the cavalry. So let's roll two dice. I may have done this already, but I'm going to roll them again. So we've got a two, oh, a two, and a five. We are at extended range. <coughs> uh, Prussian infantry is not as good as the French infantry, so they're at extended range at two. So that eight strength is dropping to four straight away. Okay. Um, so a two on, oh, sorry, a four on the two is another no effect. However, we do have um, the benefit of the target being uh, cavalry. And if 50% of the strength points in the hex you're shooting at are cavalry, you get a three buff because cavalry are pretty uh, exposed to, to things like shooting. Um, so uh, we rolled a two and we are going up three, so we're on a four. I appreciate you just can't see that, um, which is a morale test. So we do another morale test. And this time we have a six uh, TCR on the cavalry um, minus the five. And the five will be a plus one. Um, that's not right. It's five minus six. This is one of the things I, I confuse. So that, that, that number minus that number is minus one. So they get away from it with without being too badly sharp the cavalry okay that's the end of the firing phase fire combat now we come to movement and i'm going to do a few things here to illustrate movement which you may not necessarily do if, if you were playing this in the, in, in the real world so to speak um so the first thing we'll do is we'll we'll look at things like terrain um so for example we're going to move our infantry towards this infantry. One, two. Now, that's okay. That's clear terrain they're in. There's only a terrain modifier of one. But we've moved into the um, an area adjacent to an infantry unit, or any other unit, really. And so there's no zone of control if you've played war games before, but what you can do is the... The person who is uh, non-active, so in this case the French player, that unit can can use defensive fire, and basically that means every time somebody moves through your your the 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 area in which you um, have adjacent to you, so basically the six hexes around. Um, every time you move, you shoot. So um, we have two and a five. This time the Prussians um, are the ones moving, so the target 
are the Prussians and the French uh, are within effective range. So that's no problem. They are French, so they get a buff. So we rolled a two on a strength of six minus one because of the shaken results. So a strength of five, they rolled a two. They happen to be French, so they get a buff that way. Um, they do not have anything else currently, but the fact that they've um, moved forward because of the fact that they're better shots, better, better equipment, uh, perhaps not better shots, definitely better equipment, they roll their morale test. So again, we have the the white die roll um, minus the TCR, that's an eight. So the result is a good one for the the um, Prussians. That's fine. They can carry now, carry on their move. So what they're going to do is they're going to they've moved one, two, three, and they're going to risk being shot at again. Like I said, you may not want to do this if you were actually playing the game for real. Um, and I think I'll swap the dice to show you the actual faction-specific dice. There we go. So we roll a seven and a five. Now a seven with a strength value of six, uh, sorry, five is pretty good. So here we are with morale test plus two as the result, as the baseline. But you then need to go through that process of checking the columns. Um, and they're French, so they move to uh, column, row column six. Um, multiple defensive fires, it's this bit here. That's the bit we need now. They've multiple, that unit has within this activation done defensive fire more than once. So you modify backwards. So one, two, so we've gone down a bit. Okay, this is them shooting at their target multiple times while the target's moving. Um, there's no other terrain to factor in at this point. So we simply have a morale test plus one. What that means is the um, we have a five as the the morale dice plus one to make that a six so we deduct that six from the tcr of eight and that's fine there's no effect there okay okay so that defensive fire is how units exert control over the hexes around them there's no zone of control type stuff as you might find in many other games this unit is now free to move again now they can if they really want to get shot at again they can move here or they can go into the terrain and one thing about this game is that there is a lot of different terrain. Um, I'm not going to give every single bit, but to move from a clear terrain to clear terrain, it's a one. Moving into a forest, it's a two for infantry and HQ. We're in infantry, so we need to expend two. We've only got um, one movement point left, so we really can't do much more movement, but we have at least moved to there. The HQ will move, so, oh, sorry, let's do the horse artillery first. We're not going to move the horse artillery into um, any kind of line of fire or anything like that, but we're simply just going to move one, two, so here, just in case we need to shoot it later at that same unit. Artillery cannot move, they fired. This guy can move five, um, but we won't just yet. Um, you don't, you don't have to do it in this kind of descending order, but we'll wait a minute. We'll just see what happens to this unit first before we do anything else with the movement there. Um, and the reason for that is there are certain movement rules around the roads, but let's just come back to that. Um, these will move again, and it will go one and two. And again, defensive fire. Um, so six and an eight. Uh, so we have wherever the appropriate chart has gone. We have uh, strength five, roll to six. Morale test is French defensive fires, so it's a morale test. The morale die is six, the TCR is eight. That's fine, that unit is fine. Um, we won't move the unit here. Um, I'll come back to the cavalry. And so we're down here now, so let's move 
this way. Now roads negate all other terrain as, as you'd normally find. Move to here. Defensive fire again from the artillery this time, so which is not good, but we'll see how it goes. So here we have three and oh, can't see that. There's a three and a six. We're at canister range. So that strength seven artillery unit is now going to get a 50% buff, so that's going to be a strength 10 artillery unit. Ouch, firing at um, our poor beleaguered infantry. So let's go through the list again. Um, nothing really applies. We don't have any events to play. They're not in a town currently. Um, okay, so basically it's a straight up three on strength 10, which is morale test plus two. So that six is now an eight. Um, and so eight minus the eight is going to be zero. And zero, I believe, is a simple morale hit, which means we apply that shaken result. Okay. Um, we'll just move him. So we'll move along the road and then we'll move again like like so. So one, two, three. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Okay, cool. Defensive fire. We have a two and a three. Canister range again. Um, so two. Uh, that'd be a four though, wouldn't it? Because that... No, three. Sorry, because that canister range. Um, uh, but, but uh, multiple defensive fires brings it down, down this way, so it's no no effect. Okay, that's nice and simple. Um, and then we will move the cavalry, and this is where those differences in um, weights come in. Cavalry have a special type of movement called the cavalry charge, um, and I'm again I'm going to have to check the rules for this one um, because. Uh, they are uh, <laughs> various ins and outs of how you do it, and you have counter charges and all sorts of things, right? Um, okay, so you simply move it adjacent to the intended target. Um, now, there's a few things to go through. You cannot do the cavalry charge if you're shaken or disrupted. You cannot be adjacent at the start. You must have line of sight. You cannot pass through any other units and only enter clear or clear road terrain, which we are in. Um, and then if all the above conditions are met, you roll a 1d10, and if it's equal to TCR, you do get to do the charge. So TCR is, uh, wrong one, the TCR is seven. We roll a five. Um, so a bit of a done, where were we? is less than or equal to, we conduct the charge. Fine, great, we've conducted the charge. Okay, so we've moved our piece adjacent. Um, there's a bunch of stuff there about assault. Um, okay, cavalry, that's the charge, that, that's the charge, the assault for that charge takes place during the combat step, which is next. Um, now, however, you can, as the French player uh, in, in, in this example, so the defending cavalry unit, can counter charge um, if it is the target of a charge. I hope that makes any sense. So again, the counter charging cavalry, so the French one this, in this instance, cannot be shaken or disrupted. Um, and again, same thing, you roll a d10, in this case it's a 5, we've rolled less than the TCR, which is a 6, so you can do the counter charge. Um, okay, yeah, so basically what's happened is the Cavalry's moved, moving, this one's rushed forward to meet it. So it's not a cavalry um, charge combat at the end, it's a standard assault combat. 
good this may okay right yeah i this that's one thing that always gets me with this okay right that's not going to be a cavalry charge that's a standard assault but i'm going to leave the marker on there just to show that we did attempt the charge okay um end of the movement step um i'm not going to move that artillery so now we're going to go to assault which is the next the next step um and basically with assault like with many many other games um you, you have a separate assault table with separate things that influence it okay so you have two different tables um, and the results again depend on dice roll and strength adjustments um, with certain specific results you have certain uh, odds will affect the um, will affect things the the cavalry charging will affect certain things um, those strength point bonuses for light and medium and heavy had the charge been successful and not not counter charged we would have had a benefit but there was that counter charge um, and so on and so forth but let's go back go to sort of a straightforward assault first straightforward haha <laughs> um, so we have a, a two units here attacking here um, and what I'll do is I'll just pop on the relevant counter because you need to choose a lead hex and I'm going to do for argument's sake choose that one as the lead hex um, okay so and that's that's the lead hex that's known as the def supporting hex the unit that you're fighting is the defending hex there's sort of reasons for that kind of clarity um, which hopefully we'll go through um, you add together all of the um, uh, strength points in the lead assault hex and subtract the defending um, strength points uh, bear with me the hexes are referred to as lead hex um, supporting hex and defending hex when you come to do the combat you need to add up all of the uh, strength points in the lead hex so in this case it's just one so it's six but if there were several you'd add them up uh, the stacking is usually two um, units but there are variations on that which is why I haven't really gone into it depends on the scenario and what units you have um, and and you're going to d deduct the defending strength points from the um, lead hex strength points so in this case it's six minus the one for being shaken so that's five so it's six minus five which is one um, and so the differential on the table is one okay you're then going to do the same thing as before when you roll roll the 2d6 in this case we've got a seven and a five um, and then run through that um, process of, of moving tables so we were on a one as terms of the, co the column such as here we are um, Prussian infantry. Yay, very good. We're better than the French, um, at least within game terms. Um, so now we're at plus two. We are also using a flanking attack, which is where the supporting hex comes in, which gives us a plus two. And it's a flanking attack because our units are not adjacent and we're attacking the same space. Um, so now we're at plus four. Uh, terrain, no one's in any funny terrain, there's no towns or anything involved, we don't have any events going on, um, TCRs is an 8 versus a 7, so we do have a better TCR, which moves us forward another one, okay, cool, so we're now at a plus 5, okay, um, and so 7 on a plus 5 is a D2, so that means defending loses 2 uh, two, two, two hits basically. Now one of those hits must in must be it was called a casualty hit. That's what the little asterisk means next to the two. Okay. Um, so you take two hits 
Um, so the first thing you do is you disrupt it. That's one. Well, well, let me go back a little bit. Let me go back a little bit. When you take hits, there's a few options you can choose. Okay. Um, you can retreat one hex per point. You can apply a morale hit, which is the this shaken to disrupted, or, or you can apply a casualty hit. A casualty hit is flipping over. So I can, as the French player, move, retreat, but I can't really retreat towards any other units um, because they've got artillery here, we've got defending here, so really we can only go this way. Um, but we have to apply one of those those hits as a casualty hit. So we can only go one step as a as a retreating um, uh, unit. Now we uh, um, just double checking because I'm not sure if the defensive fire would apply. So you know, if I move here, do they get shot at again? I'm not sure. I think there may be something. Like that. I can't see anything like that in the in the in the um, rules immediately. However, oh no, we do. Remember that retreating unit moves adjacent to any enemy units you have defensive fire. So um, um, this is this is one of the things I'm constantly having to rest It's a rule book when I'm, when I'm playing this game. Um, so if this unit was to take one of those hits as a defensive fire, and if it moved in any, basically in any direction, it would then suffer more fire from these units. So that's a bad idea. So we're just going to take it as a disrupted. That's our morale hit. Our casualty hit that we have to do at least one is flip to um, flip over to the um, battle one, the battle one side. Now, sometimes you will be asked to do a break test. Um, and break tests are when you decide or when you determine whether that the a unit is out of the game not out of the game permanently, but out of the game for um, um, a temporary period so that you can rally. Now, um, I believe casualty hits do trigger a break test, but only when you hit when you get two of them. So if you're fresh and you get two casualty hits, you have to take a break test. If you're battle worn and one casualty hit, you then have to do a, a break test. Um, okay, and that's another die roll to check against the TCR number. And then if you do break, you basically, you're taken out of the game into the um, boxes on the side of the map that where you live until you can rally and try and bring them back on. That's basically how it works. But for this purpose here, we won't do that because that sort of, yeah, the, the, that it, it, it's getting, yeah, we won't do that for this part, for the purpose of this video. This is getting a bit confusing, isn't it? Um, okay. Um, so that unit is, is staying put for now. The cavalry charge, which was negated um, by the counter charge, is going to be a straightforward assault combat. Um, so the same thing, um, but this time with cavalry. Um, we don't have any of those benefits for weight because the, the charge failed. Um, so the same thing, strength points is two and four. So I am actually, as the Prussian player, at a negative two um, because I have less strength than the, the French, basically. Um, and so we've got the dice. And we have a two and a five. Um, now, we didn't need to check before because the strength points were the same, but this time we have an odds differential as well as everything else. And it's a one to two. So we start off badly at minus two and we move straight away to minus three. Um, we don't have anything else applicable except the better TCR. Our French unit has a seven versus, sorry, our Prussian unit has a seven TCR versus a six. So we move from minus three back to minus two. And there's nothing else I think applicable. So that 
d roll of two and minus two is attacker takes two losses, one of which must be a casualty hit. And this time we can retreat. So we're going to flip ourselves over to battle worn and then retreat. Okay, that unit basically sucks. Um, now you can uh, do breakthrough movement as the attacker. Um, but I don't believe you can do so. Um, no, uh, attacking units can do breakthrough movement, which is where you would you would, if it had been reversed, you would move forward. But defending units can't do that. Okay, that's the end of that combat. Moving on to this combat, we're going to choose the uh, unit here as the lead unit um, and so this time it's a seven minus seven so it's a zero differential we are attacking artillery now artillery um, have a, oh, a minus 50 percent okay so that is going to be uh, seven versus three so that's going to put us at a because we dropped the fraction uh, a three okay we're prussian infantry uh, seven versus three is it also a two to one, which pushes us up to six. Uh, anything else? Prussians are not in a t they're not in a town or anything. Um, there's no hasty works. Hasty works give you a column shift, basically. Um, but we do have a better TCR, so we're now at. Is that right? I think we're at plus three, plus seven. No, hold on. So it's plus three Prussian. Better TCR. Plus two, yeah, it was plus seven. We're at plus seven. Okay, so our roll of two on a plus seven is a D1. And D1 is a defender loss. And so the loss, as before, is either a retreat or a hit of some kind. So as the French, we don't really want to retreat too much. And we don't want to take a casualty hit. Um, sorry. Yeah, we don't want to take a casualty hit, so we're going to just take a morale hit, which moves our artillery down to shaken. Okay, I hope this is making sense. It, it's quite a lot, and it's a game that I, I you can probably tell I, I do struggle a little bit with remembering all the little minutia. Um, okay, that is the end of the uh, assault step. Okay, and remember, we're still doing the same activation. Now, the next thing we need to consider is the rally step. But if you remember, our HQ was uh, aggressive, so you do not do the rally step for aggressive, aggressive play, um, aggressive postures. Then the out command step, and this is where had units not been within command range, you would then reveal that chip we talked about in the, in the introduction and do that action. We don't have anybody out command currently, so it would skip that step. Back to the uh, chip pull phase, or the chip draw phase. Oh, just need to take off some of these markers. Um, okay, Prussian aggressive tactics. This is a French chit. Okay, and that will force the German, sorry, the Prussian player to um, select a Prussian. Infantry or cavalry unit within two hexes, um, immediately moved and then basically attacks. Okay, now that can force a infantry unit to enter something horrible. You know, uh, force them to attack the artillery or something, um, which is good for the French player. However, upon this scenario board over here, we do have that command event that we played. Um, into the Prussian aggressiveness track. And so we have a chance to cancel this chit as the Prussians. So on a roll of one to three, um, because we've only played one chit on the track, roll of one to three, we cancel that, that French chit. So let's try that. Roll of two. Awesome. This has worked. These are now out of the game. Well, out of the round anyway, out of the turn. Um, back to the chip draw phase. Here we have Marshal Bazaine. This is one of those CIC, CIC chits. 
No, they have to. There's a slight difference between the German and the, sorry, the Prussian and the um, French version of this. Basically, being the um, Prussians can hold and play play it when they feel like it. The French cannot. They have to play it when it's drawn. And so, we can select any one unit or grouped division to activate, even if it has already activated. And then they proceed to do things. Um, and so basically they can conduct a normal activation phase. Okay, and they're considered in command, so a normal activation phase. Okay, um, I think what we'll do is we'll pull some of these, for ease, we'll pull some of these, um, these units here forward. So we'll move one, crossing the stream is going to be two, I believe, for infantry. Uh, yep, and that's as far as they can go. And then we will do the same here. One, two, that's as far as they can go. So just for demonstration, you can activate using that, that chip. You might not necessarily have wanted to do that. You could obviously shoot with your artillery or something, but for the purposes of the scenario. Krupp's guns, another event. Now, the Prussian artillery are pretty awesome when I can find their event chip track. And the Krupp's guns allow you to use them. You can issue opportunity fire, which I'll explain in a moment, or you can move a chosen artillery unit, half its movement allowance, and then issue fire. So basically you can turn regular artillery into horse artillery, okay? Um, now, I'm debating currently which way to use that. Let's use it as opportunity fire, I think. Um, but that would involve us holding, so we'll hold on to that, okay? We won't play that now, we'll hold that. I'll just place it there to remind myself to use it. Then we have the Prussian version of the CIC chip. And this I can hold or I can play immediately. Um, and I think, I think what I'll do is I will, I'll move my artillery a little bit closer. So I'll move one, two, three, and then four. That's what I'll do with that one. Um, I won't worry about group divisions, which is where people, units within the same division within a brigade can, can move, um, but you can activate a unit if it's come before, I think is the best way I'll explain that. Um, okay, command event for the French. Uh, we won't worry about um, the command chip. We'll just play it for its event. So it's an inspirational leadership. Okay, I think we one of these before, didn't we? Um, that was the Prussians. So you hold it. You don't play it immediately, but you can use it later to um, remove a morale marker. Um, you can... move towards an, uh, uh, towards an assault combat, or you can rally. Okay, that might be useful because the rally, um, hmm, let's try and, let's hold on to that. Maybe we use that for rally. I'll place it there just to remind myself again. So, you know, even though the Prussians have activated, you, the French don't actually know when they're going to activate at this point. Um, okay. Command event again. Inspirational leadership is the same thing for the Prussians. Um, I believe it's actually the same. It's the same. We must hold on to that. We'll hold on to that. So we now have two that we can play when we choose to. As the Prussian player. Uh, okay. Um, we've just pulled um, Battlefield Conditions. Now this is uh, a chip that you play during combat and if I recall correctly it gives you a buff towards your... yeah, here we go. 
um, you hold and you play before fire or assault and you get a column shift depending on whether you're attacking or defending so that we, we all have these like now have these stores of, of of chits that you can use you don't have to use them on the um, activation you know, if you, in a normal game you have more than one brigade you don't have to use them on the next activated brigade you can use them on a later activated brigade so if you have like for example on my, my game over here if you wanted to activate the uh, the buffs third brigade um, you can wait until the activation chit's drawn you don't have to draw it use it on the the you know if if Frossard's division in that sort of light grey colour was was um, was activated you can choose when to use it so it's quite a flexible way of getting support when you need it which is really cool um, okay just a couple of chits left um, fortunes of war everything that can go wrong will go wrong that's what this is now the way this works is you roll a d10 you roll a five and then you cross reference the table um, to identify what happens and it's going to either degrade or enhance the next chip pulled five will degrade it okay so if it's an event chip we'll pull next nothing will happen it will be discarded if it is a activation chip or a cic chip you must be in defensive posture and then only in command units fire uh, out of command units do not um, do not fire because the out command step is ignored. Uh, so basically, all that all that this unit can do, this, the whole division, all it can do is fire next turn. Nothing else. Okay. Um, and the last ship then is this, and all they can do is fire. And uh, because we've already gone through the fire combat and so on, I won't repeat it now for the video, but that's all they can do this turn. Okay. Um, once you've completed the activations, um, you don't, I don't think you even rally. No, you don't even rally, even though you're in defense, uh, defensive posture. Okay. Um, so that's the end of our, our um, chip pull activation phase within the turn um, the rally step because of that that fog of war chip you don't do rally and you don't do our command okay but so what i'll do is i'll show you those separately um, and then you do the french command events event step and the prussian command event step um, and that relates to these tracks if you, you certain things will happen at the end of the turn and you roll the dice to see whether you get extra reinforcements or whether you bring in certain chits and so on. So that's when you do this bit primarily most of the time. Um, then you work out victory conditions. Um, none of our units have achieved their aims of getting to various towns, so they will take another turn. Um, and then we, we remove various markers and so on, and then we go back to the planning phase. Okay, now because we didn't get to see out of command, let me just show you out of command and also rally. Um, out of command, I'll do first. Now, out, the out of command um, depends on the um, the the posture and the um, command range of the units. So let's say this is a put them into defensive posture so we can do the rally as well but um, you have a range of four or a range of three so we've got a range of four okay and he was there I think wasn't he now remember that command range is one hex um, that's fine so these guys are all in in range yeah if you go through forest you're out of range you know you, you don't have one command point per hex it's two if you go through forest so in this instance we'll have one two two three four five so this is out of command okay um and also the um one two three four yeah that's out of command as well roads is actually half a command point like i said but this is out of command 
right, I, yeah, half, half. I think he's actually in command. So one, two, three. No, uh, one, two, three. Oh, actually, he's in command. So it's just this one. This one's out of command. So what you'll do is you'll grab one of these out of the cup. And you'll just place it on, let's try and draw another one. You place it on top of the unit. Now, that unit does nothing when everybody else activates. So, you know, you'll shoot, you'll move, you'll assault, various other things. But this will stay where he is until after the rally step. Now, the rally step, which you can only do when you're in a defensive posture, there's two, two parts to it. The first part is to... Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact terminology. The first part is recovery, and the second part is rebuilding. Recovery is to um, uh, flip over a, a shaken, disrupted unit if there's any low or ration ammo or anything like that. Um, so that's recovered. Okay, you can only recover up to the value of the command unit rating. Okay, so we've recovered. Okay, now rebuilding, which we haven't gone into because we've not taken anybody off the map, but that involves bringing a detachment or a, a um, not a detachment, but a division or, a, or units out of the rebuilding box, which is off the screen at the moment. So that's the step that you would do for that. It's fairly basic, straightforward compared to some of the other stuff. The outer command happens after rally, um, and you simply flip this over look at what it says. So in this case, oh, we've got a manoeuvre, okay? And manoeuvre um, is um, on this table here. So uh, you simply do normal movement, okay? So we've got a movement of three. So we're just going to move two to make sure he's in, he's in, in, in range of command next turn. But for example, you may be forced to withdraw you may be completely frozen in place or you may half move half fire um, or you may attack it's representing any random action that a unit may do without the command structure in place it's really good fun and you can have some really wildly random things that you really don't want to happen okay right I hope that has been helpful. It's been uh, a fairly rambling <laughs> run through of the rules as I understand them. Um, there are definitely things that I haven't covered, um, partly because they haven't cropped up in this little example and partly because they're part of the campaign and, and so on and so forth. Um, there are certain movement issues that I alluded to before where in a defensive posture, uh, if I just clear these out of the way for demonstration, um, when you use road movement, you can move, it's ordinarily one per hex, yeah? But on a major road, you can move half as a, in a defensive posture as the road march. So one, two, three, and so on. So let's say this guy's moved three. If he then chooses to do the same, he go one and a half, but then he cannot go through this unit unless he pays the normal terrain so it's going to be a full movement point and what you end up with is basically this big traffic jam of people where they can't get past um because the the roads are clogged basically that's what that represents um i think that's the only real thing the main the main one that wasn't in the in the, in the playthrough anyhow as i said enough rambling from me i hope it's given you an idea of how this works um it is a game that I very much enjoy, but it does take me a long time to play because it is quite a long game anyway, very long game anyway, but it's longer because I need to reference the rules. There's so many little things and though each individual thing is not that difficult, which is hopefully what came across. There's a lot to think about each time you do anything. I think, I think road movement is the only thing I didn't cover in the main exa the main example of play. Most other things are covered to one degree or another, um, although there have been some things I haven't covered, either because they're part of the campaign rules, which I haven't got to yet, or because I just forgot. <laughs> um, 
So that's hopefully enough though to give you a feel for how it works and the sort of game you're gonna get yourself into if you decide to pick it up. So I hope it's been helpful. Um, if it hasn't, please do check the game out anyway because it's a great game. It is a really good game. It's just, it's one that I am personally having a bit of a struggle to, to memorize some of the rules um, and it takes me even longer than it would normally because of the reference in the rule book a lot, but it's a good one. I do enjoy it um, and I hope you will too. I've been Neil from Diagonal Move and I'll see you next time.